Morning, everybody. Welcome to an oral argument session at the Fifth District Court of Appeal. My name is Dan Traver. I'm joined this morning on this panel by Judge Meredith Sasso and Judge Mary Nardello. Um, I should advise you that this is being uh, recorded. It's also being streamed live. Uh, this is case number 5D21-1841, Universal Property and Casualty Insurance Company versus Andre Modi as personal representative of the estate of Anarud Modi. Um, Mr. Lima, I believe you are the, you are the appellant in this case. Um, I will assume, unless you tell me differently, that you'd like five minutes for rebuttal. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, may it please the court. My name is Paolo Lima here on behalf of the appellant, Universal Property Insurance. Um, we, we start with the uh, reason we're here today is because the trial court erred in granting a directed verdict for the plaintiff in this trial as to liability. Uh, and it did so because it concluded as a matter of law that the insured's breaches of, the, of his post-loss policy conditions were not material. And so the, the main argument that we've made in our initial brief is that um, that would, the evidence did not support a directed verdict here. Materiality of a breach is almost always an issue of fact. And if we look at the trial evidence, as was set out in our brief, there was more than sufficient to, at the very least, create an issue of fact to submit those defenses to the jury. Uh, I, I don't believe that the uh, plaintiff has even attempted to make a substantive defense of, of that decision on the merits. Uh, my reading of the, uh, the answer brief is that they are relying on several different procedural arguments as to, to support the judgment. So unless the court has any questions as to the, the main merits of the, the trial court's decision, I'll proceed to addressing the plaintiff's uh, various arguments. Um, the first one is invited error. Uh, the argument was that Universal's counsel invited the ruling the, made by the trial judge We've cited some case law that we think is directly on point, uh, specifically the SNI Investments case from the fourth DCA in 2010, which holds that it has to be for invited error to apply, the appellant has to have invited the specific ruling made by the trial court that they are now complaining of. And that just wasn't the case here. Um, as we've sort of set out in, in detail in both our initial and the reply brief, the way it went down was that the Defense counsel made the argument that the trial judge could decide as a matter of law that the breach was material if there had been no compliance at all. In other words, a, a breach with no attempt to comply with the policy conditions. And that was based on this case's, uh, this court's holding in Starling from 2007. But counsel also noted that based on this court's Lopez decision, that if there is some compliance with a policy post-loss condition, well, that creates an issue of fact for the jury to decide. Um, at no time did Universal's counsel argue that uh, the court could decide as a matter of law that a breach was not material. And that is precisely the, the ruling that the trial judge made here. What is so, your response? I, I would anticipate uh, that your friend on the other side would point to page 552 of the transcript where um, counsel for Universal says, as a matter of law, I'm suggesting it's a material breach. And the court says, who rules on that? And um, then counsel says, it's a legal issue. You have to say yes or no to that. Your Honor, I admit that this, uh, this issue came up several times during the trial. And um, you know, admittedly, it didn't come out as clearly the second time around as it did the first time around. But to the extent that there was any confusion there, to the extent that maybe there's an argument that Universal's counsel did sort of make that blanket statement, it's it's eliminated because after the trial judge made his ruling and said, OK, well, I'm finding as a matter of law, the breach was not material. Universal's counsel at page 548 of the transcript says, uh, essentially took issue with that and said, Judge, there is a factual question. There has been evidence presented. There was a breach. And now it is a question for the jury. You can't make that decision. Taking it away from the jury, there is a question of fact for the jury to decide. So even if uh, there had arguably been a, you know, a, a misstatement that the trial judge interpreted in, in a certain manner, 
there's no question that Universal's counsel then came around and gave the trial judge the opportunity to create to correct that error, which of course is the, the fundamental tenet of appellate review is, was the trial judge given a chance to make the right ruling? And here he was, and the trial judge says, well, I'm sticking by my ruling. Uh, I've made my call and, and that's that. So for those reasons and you know everything else stated in the brief, we'd say the invited error doctrine just doesn't apply. Uh, under the facts of these case. Um, the next argument that they've raised is a pleading defect based on this court's ruling in Saavedra. And again, as we pointed out in detail in our reply brief, uh, Saavedra certainly does say that you have to be specific in asserting affirmative defenses. But if you compare Universal's pleading in Saavedra versus Universal's pleading in this case, the pleading in this case, we would submit clearly passes muster under the Saavedra standard. In Saavedra, again, the Universal's response to the allegation that all conditions precedent had been complied with was simply denied and strict proof thereof demanded. Here, on the other hand, the response to that allegation was Universal denies the allegations contained in paragraph 14, strict proof thereof is hereby demanded. Then it goes on to say, however, specifically, Failure to provide prompt notice, failure to make reasonable and necessary repairs, failure to mitigate damages, failure to provide documents among other conditions. So there is a very specific denial there. Similarly, within the affirmative defense itself, in Saavedra, Universal merely stated that the plaintiff, quote, failed to satisfy all conditions proceeding to recover pursuant to the terms of the policy. Here, on the other hand, it uh, universal pled that liability, if any, is only in accordance with the terms and provisions of the policy. But then it went on to reprint verbatim the relevant provisions of the policy. And it, important to note that it didn't just cut and paste you know, the entire your duties after loss of the policy. It identified the specific provisions that universal relied on at summary judgment and then again at trial specifically the prompt notice, the failure to protect the property, and the failure to provide records and documents that we request. So again, there has a, it's a far cry from Saavedra. Uh, and in fact, in Saavedra, the court said when sort of spelling out what the defendant had done wrong, this court wrote, at no point did Universal identify the nature of the conditions precedent or the nature of the noncompliance, such as the specific post-loss duties with which Saavedra failed to comply, or where exactly in the policy such conditions could be found. Um, as I've just read to the court, uh, Universal did exactly in this case what the court said in Saavedra needed to be done, needed to be pled. Um, the next issue I'll sort of turn to is the, the plaintiff's contention in the answer brief that Universal denied coverage and therefore waived its right to demand compliance with the policy conditions um, citing the fourth district's case in, in Bryant versus Giavera. Uh, that case is good law. However, it's certainly not applicable here because quite simply Universal did not deny coverage. Um, if you look at plaintiff's answer brief at page 26, in fact, they say Universal quote, confirmed coverage for the claim. And we'll look at, uh, I'm looking at here, Universal's letter of February 7th, 2017. It's pages 1386 and 87 of the record, and it begins uh, in the very second sentence of the letter. It says, although your claim damages are covered, are covered by your policy of insurance, repair costs must exceed the applicable policy deductible for claim payment to be considered. And so, therefore, we clearly do not have a denial of coverage, and the Bryant case and that principle just doesn't apply here. There's been no waiver. Uh, plaintiff raises another related uh, issue, very, very similar, that there's been an anticipatory breach by Universal. Uh, again, it's based on this, this notion that Universal has denied coverage. As I've just read to you, there was no denial of coverage and therefore no anticipatory breach. Uh, the plaintiff relies on a fourth district's case in Goldberg, a case we're very familiar with that happened to be, you know, our firm had handled that appeal. And in Goldberg, the key language is the, the fourth district's pronouncement that an insurer, quote, should not be deemed to have breached the contract where it accepted coverage and paid the only estimate it received of the actual cash value of the loss. 
Now here, Universal did accept coverage of Dr. Modi's claim. It did not make a payment, but again, the only reason for that is, is because the only estimate of damages fell below the policy deductible. And at no time prior to, to filing suit, did plaintiff ever provide a competing estimate saying, well, yes, I understand Universal's position that the damages fall below the uh, policy deductible, but here's my estimate for more money and that's what you need to pay me. Never happened in this case. And under Goldberg, the holding is, unless you submit a competing estimate, there's no anticipatory breach. And so we would say that that does not apply either. The final argument that they've raised in, in the answer brief, and again, we've addressed in our, in our reply brief, and certainly rely on, the, on our reply, is that Universal um, needed to request compliance with these policy conditions, and it didn't request compliance, and therefore somehow perhaps it's been waived. Um, we point out, first of all, that two of the three policy conditions relied upon by Universal uh, don't request any additional or don't require any additional request for compliance. One is to give prompt notice. The other is to protect the property from further damage. Both of those conditions are self-executing by the very language of the policy. In other words, you, you can't expect Universal to request a plaintiff to give prompt notice of a claim um, other than in the policy. Uh, until you tell me there's a claim, I can't request you to give prompt notice other than what we've already done, which is by putting into the policy you have a claim, you have to give prompt notice. The only other, uh, and so that alone would be sufficient to support a reversal, but just to tie it all up, the third condition uh, does require a request because it says that uh, the plaintiff is required to provide us with records and documents we request. Uh, and as we've stated in our brief, Universal made multiple requests for additional uh, documents to support the claim. Most notably, the most direct one came on March 15, 2017, in a letter and email. Uh, there's different language in, an email, in the cover email as well as the letter that was actually sent to plaintiff's public adjuster. Um, and the email says, please forward your estimate of damages, walk through photographs, and any additional information you believe will be helpful for us in the evaluation of this claim. Um, the testimony is that it's unrebutted that at no time prior to filing suit did the plaintiff provide any of those documents. In fact, the only two documents that were ever submitted prior to suit were uh, the notice of claim and a letter requesting appraisal under the policy. Um, it, last thing I'll note is that there's some argument in the answer brief that uh, some of these communications went to an administrative assistant at plaintiff's public adjuster, a woman by the name of Nora Catano, and that uh, I guess the argument is that she wasn't authorized to act on, on plaintiff's behalf. But if you look at the trial as evidence, again, that is clearly not the case. Plaintiff's public adjuster is a man named Kevin Downs, and he was asked at trial whether his assistant, Ms. Catano, routinely communicated with the insurance companies on behalf of their clients. And he said, yes, it happened all the time. And if you look at this case itself, uh, Ms. Catano is the only one who actually ever communicated with Universal. She's the one who reported, who sent the email reporting the claim to Universal. She's the one who sent the letter, emailed the letter requesting appraisal. Uh, and plaintiff's own testimony at, uh, during his deposition, he passed away prior to trial, but his deposition testimony, which was played at trial to the jury, was, quote, Nora Katana. She is the administrator of Five Star Claims Adjusting. She sent a letter explaining everything to Universal. So plaintiff's own understanding is clear that Ms. Katana was authorized to speak on his behalf. Um, and so for that reason, we would say that that last uh, argument raised by the plaintiff in the answer brief does not apply and doesn't warrant a reversal. Now, unless the court has any further questions, I'll reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Any other questions? All right, uh, counsel for the appellee, is it uh, Ms. Dees? Dice, Judge. Dice, apologies, ma'am. You may proceed. Perfect. Thank you, Judge. Uh, may I please the court, Christine Dice, on behalf of the appellee. And as uh, Mr. Lima alluded, the majority of our argument is relying upon the invited error doctrine pursuant to the arguments made by Universal's counsel at the charge conference. So that would be our first argument that this current the court can. 
can affirm the final judgment based upon the invited error doctrine. And the case law makes it clear, um, the case law we had cited in our answer brief, what Universal needed to do to prevent triggering the invited error doctrine, but Universal took none of those actions. After Universal successfully argued at the charge conference that the court could rule as a matter of law, that um, the plaintiff materially breached policy conditions, Universal never stopped to advise the court that it perhaps misunderstood Universal's argument um, or, mis or that Universal mistakenly induced a ruling that it didn't intend to induce. Instead, Universal repeatedly told the court that it could rule as a matter of law on material breach of policy conditions. And it just so happened that Universal, that the court um, agreed with Universal's argument, but determined that the plaintiff did not materially breach policy conditions. And at that point in time, Universal had an opportunity to tell the trial court what the what Universal's attempting to argue now on appeal. And that's that the only argument that Universal was making to the court at that point in time was that it could determine as a matter of law that if there was no compliance with policy conditions, that the plaintiff materially breached the policy. Um, but Universal should have specified that at the trial court level or in its motion for a new trial, but it chose not to do that. Instead, uh, Universal did nothing to alert the court or to allow the court to reconsider this issue. And What's your response, to, your response to uh, the argument that immediately after the ruling, um, Universal's counsel clarified that its position was only that the court could decide that it was a material breach as a matter of law, and that when we look at that in context, um, it might have not been perfectly articulated throughout the entire trial, but the position is, is clear once you look at that kind of last uh, exchange. Indeed, Judge, I would agree to a certain extent that Universal did backpedal and say, um, oh, it's actually a factual issue that should be submitted to the jury. But Universal never, really, never formally retracted its argument that the court could rule as a matter of law on the issue. And it never. What else would they have needed to do? I'm I mean, sorry. That, that's not a formal retraction. What else would they have needed to do? They would have, so, under the case law for the invited error doctrine, they would have had to alert the court to its error in either um, subsequent, right subsequent to the court's ruling or in its motion for a rehearing or a retrial. Um, and instead, the Universal simply continued to argue that it was actually a fact, factual issue that needed to be submitted to the jury, but again, didn't ever tell the court that. Um, it misunderstood or misapprehended its argument that the court could rule as a matter of law that um, the plaintiff materially breached policy conditions, but the court could not rule as a matter of law that the plaintiff did not materially breach policy conditions. That distinction um, from our reading of the trial transcript um, and from our reading of the motion for a new trial was never made. And so the trial judge was never given an opportunity to reconsider the argument after that clarification was made. And so, I think you'd agree. I think you'd agree that the context in which this arose was kind of odd, in the sense that here we are arguing the charge conference, and it almost seems like the insurer's directed verdict motion gets resuscitated. Um, I guess I'm struggling to see how an insurer's offensive argument that the insured uh, committed a material breach of the policy could find itself getting a directed verdict against it going the opposite direction um, that the insured's uh, actions were immaterial um, as a matter of law. Um, so given the odd context, and I recognize that you weren't the trial lawyer in this particular case, um, where in the invited error um, body of case law do we see something like that, where the resuscitation of an offensive argument turns into a legal judgment from a judge going in the opposite direction? I just may have a moment to look through my cases. Yeah, but... I, I think it's a hard question because I, I, I don't know that there's any. So it, it, like I said, it's a weird context. And then in that situation, you go from resuscitating an offensive argument, a legal argument, which the trial court previously denied, not, not unconventionally saying materiality is typically a jury issue. And then it turns into a judgment going the opposite direction. I just struggle to see how the invited error doctrine applies in that specific situation. 
So judge, I don't have a specific case on point um, for that to answer that question, but the closest case I do have is um, this case is this court's case, Alexander versus Quail Point. And in um, that court, that case, the court affirmed um, a final judgment based upon the invited error doctrine. And um, <clears throat> and in that case, the this court held that the doctrine of invited error holds true, whether the error was invited solely by appellant's counsel being unaware of the governing law or jointly by the appellant and his opponent. And so I think that would be the most factually analogous situation um, to this case was that, um, yes, indeed, this was a factual issue that should have been submitted by the, to the jury, which is what we argued at the charge conference, but Universal argued the opposite, that it could be determined as a matter of law. And the court went with that argument. So because the court um, went and ruled as a matter of law, that gave the appellee, the plaintiff in this case, the opportunity to move for directed verdict, but that doesn't excuse the um, the invited error by Universal's counsel by arguing as a matter of law that it could be ruled upon. Does that answer the uh, court? I know it doesn't completely answer the court's question, but that's the closest uh, case I have. It's not a bad argument. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, so in addition to the Alexander versus Quail Point case, um, I'd also point the case to the uh, First District Court of Appeal case of Munia versus Canning. And in that case, um, the appellant argued to the trial court that it should enforce a contract as written, which resulted in a legally unenforceable final judgment being entered. Um, but on appeal, the, fifth the first district confirmed the final judgment based upon the invited error doctrine and said that a party cannot complain about an error for which he or she is responsible for or of rulings that he or she invited the court to make. And notably in that case, the first district court of appeal said that their ruling was strengthened um, because the appellant failed to alert the trial court to any misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the arguments, um, either at the charge conference or through a motion for rehearing. And that analogy is applicable, that, um, that reasoning is applicable here. Um, Universal, while it did attempt to backpedal and argue that it was a factual issue, uh, we don't believe that they ever formally gave the trial court um, an opportunity to reconsider its argument and um, to clarify that its argument was only as to the court ruling as a matter of law that, plaintiff, that the plaintiff materially breached policy conditions, not that it was arguing as a matter of law the court could, court could determine that the plaintiff did not materially breach policy conditions. <laughs> and the case relied upon by Universal and cited um, today, SNI Investments versus Payless, that case is distinguishable because in that case, counsel stipulated that the court could rule as a matter of law on the issue, but didn't advocate one way or another and didn't specifically induce the ruling. That was the result. And um, because, that, because of that, the fourth district determined in that case that the invited error doctrine actually was completely inapplicable. And here- if we don't see invited error your way, where does that leave you from a substantive perspective? I can get into my next argument, Judge. <laughs> Um, because we do believe that the final judgment should be also affirmed on substantive grounds as well. And that goes into my next argument, and that um, it's our position that Universal did not request compliance with certain policy conditions prior to the filing of the lawsuit. And those policy conditions are specific, specifically um, prompt notice and um, providing records and documents reasonably requested by Universal. And Universal got into this argument a little bit about the administrative assistant, and that'll be addressed. But uh, the evidence at trial and the timeline it was, as it was presented at trial simply did not support Universal's contention that it requested compliance with these policy conditions prior to the suit being filed. Counsel, and, can, I, can I ask you about the first condition, uh, which Mr. Lima says it'd be pretty much impossible to request compliance with, and that is prompt notice. Can you think of a case, a first party insurance case, where the insured fails for 100 days to notify the insurance company of a particular loss? and and let's assume the insured continues to incur or expand the damage um, as part of that loss. Can you think of a single case where the court as a matter of law found that that was not a material breach for the insured and didn't let it go to the jury? No, because these cases are, these issues are, are factual issues, Your Honor. It, um, Universal made the wrong argument by arguing that this could be ruled upon as a matter of law. Um, but typically what the jury, what the factual issue for the jury is whether or not the plaintiff provided a reasonable explanation for um, not reporting the claim as timely as they could have. 
And I, can, I may just have another minute to look through my cases, Judge, to see if I could point to one directly. Absolutely. Don't believe we cited a case directly um, related to that issue, Judge. So as I was saying, the timeline at trial simply um, didn't support that universal requested compliance, I understand. Um, the prompt notice condition, you can't necessarily request compliance with that, but it's our position that at minimum, universal did not reasonably request um, that the insured provide records and documents. And that's because as counsel alluded, there was only one request made for records and documents, and that was a single email sent to an administrative assistant of Kevin Downs, the insurance public adjuster. And this was uh, this email was sent after Universal was specifically advised that it needed to send all correspondences to the insurance representative, Kevin Downs, and it listed his email. And all letters prior to that time had been sent directly to Kevin Downs. It just so happens that this specific email was only sent to Nora Catano. And the odd thing is, the odd thing in terms of the timeline that happened was that on March 3rd, 2017, Mr. Downs, after um, Universal had issued its coverage determination, demanded appraisal of the claim because there was a dispute as to um, the amount of loss. March 15th, Universal sends a letter declining to send the claim to appraisal, which it was permitted to do under the policy because the policy required both parties to agree to appraisal. But that letter didn't request any additional documents. It just simply said, if the insured discovered any additional information, to please submit it to Universal. The same day that letter was sent, the email was sent to Ms. Catano. And that email um, was substantively different. It was the same in that it also declined to send the claim to appraisal, but it requested an estimate and walkthrough photos. However, Mr. Downs testified at trial that the only letters he received were the ones, the coverage determination letter and the letter declining to send the claim to appraisal. And both of those letters did not request any further information. It just simply said, if the insured discovered additional information to please submit that to Universal. So we believe based on these facts that there was no reasonable request for records or documents made prior to trial, prior to the filing of the lawsuit. And turning to our third argument that Universal waived the opportunity to argue policy conditions by not sufficiently asserting an affirmative defense of material breach in its answer. And the case we rely upon in support of this argument is this court's case, um, Allstate versus Farmer, and also the third district's case, um, American Integrity versus Estrada, both of which say that in order, um, both of which say that an insurance company has to plead and prove a material breach of a post-loss condition. And here, while um, Universal did indeed in its answer deny um, compliance with policy conditions, and it did specifically list out the policy conditions that have been discussed, there was no corresponding affirmative defense alleging material breach of those policy conditions. And the defendant's third affirmative defense, while it does list policy conditions, it also lists exclusions. So from the plaintiff's perspective, the third affirmative defense did not put the plaintiff on notice that the defendant intended on pursuing an affirmative defense of material breach of the discrete policy conditions it was alleging. And as the, um, the third condition that Universal alleged the plaintiff did not comply with was protecting the property from further damage. And we believe that the evidence at trial established compliance with this condition, uh, with this condition through the testimony of the plaintiff who explained that he put down buckets and towels during Hurricane Matthew to prevent further damage to the property. And following Hurricane Matthew, after he discovered that there was missing shingles at the roof, he contacted a roofer who um, attempted to perform a prepare, repair but was unsuccessful. Nonetheless, the plaintiff did indeed um, make significant efforts to protect the property from further damage. Um, turning to our last argument, anticipatory breach. Um, again, Universal um, 
Freddie kind of started this argument for me. We pointed to, um, I'm going to point the court to Goldberg versus Universal as instructive on that issue. And there, the insured reported a claim for personal property damage, but Universal declined to pay that claim. And we believe that's analogous to the insured's request for a roof replacement. During the initial inspection with the field adjuster and Mr. Downs, Mr. Downs advised Universal that the roof needed to be replaced. So before Universal issued its coverage determination letter, Universal was put on notice that a roof replacement was being requested. However, Universal's estimate that the coverage determination was based upon um, included only repair to the roof for about $250. So it's our position that because at the time a cover, the coverage letter was sent, Universal was aware that a roof replacement was requested by denying that request for a roof replacement and only paying for a roof repair, um, Universal committed an anticipatory breach, um, providing the plaintiff an immediate cause of action. And uh, while it's the appellant's, appellee's position that the invited error doctrine alone allows this court to affirm the court's ruling, um, the court's ruling should also be affirmed on the other grounds as discussed in our answer brief, with those grounds being that the evidence submitted at trial established that Universal did not request compliance with certain policy conditions prior to the filing of the lawsuit. Um, Universal waived the opportunity to argue policy conditions by not sufficiently alleging failure to um, material breach of a policy condition as affirmative defense. The evidence at trial established that the plaintiff indeed complied with policy conditions and that Universal committed an anticipatory breach by denying the request for replacement of the roof in its coverage termination letter. And unless there's um, any further questions from the panel, um, that would conclude my argument. Thank you for the court's time. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I'll start with the invited error since that seems to be the, the primary argument on their part. Um, I think we just need to really focus on the in, intention, the purpose of the invited error doctrine here. Um, it's not essentially no take backs, as, as we all argued when we were 14 years old, right? You said something, you can never take it back. Um, if you look at it in context, as the panel has, has noted, uh, while there may have been some misunderstanding, we submit that, you know, there, there shouldn't have been, uh, although counsel may have been a little bit inarticulate in in advancing his argument. The fact is that there's no question that after the trial judge said, I'm finding as a matter of law, there's no material breach, that Universal threw up its hand and said, hold on a second. We were arguing you could find as a matter of law that there was a material breach, but however, there is at a minimum conflicting evidence and it needs to go to the jury and you can't take this issue away from the jury. So no question, it was never Universal's position. The invited error doctrine is when a litigant says, ride or die, this is my position, that's it, I'm arguing it, and the error is, in, is truly invited. That's not what happened here. And um, Judge Traver, as you pointed out, it did also, there's also the wrinkle of the very odd procedural posture in which the argument arose. I'll point out, as we did in our uh, initial reply briefs, that the plaintiff never moves for a directed verdict at the close of Universal's evidence. It was only in this very odd setting of the charging conference that um, plaintiff's counsel very astutely picked up which way the judge was, was leaning and said, well, judge, in that case, if you're finding no material breach, I get a directed verdict. So um, for all those reasons, the invited error doctrine just doesn't apply here and, and the court should reject that argument. Um, and, and one other thing, the, um, the motion for a new trial, in addition to the trial judge being advised immediately at the argument of, of his error, of the misunderstanding, whatever you want to call it, it was also brought up at length in the motion for new trial, which appears at pages 1862 to 71 of the record on appeal. So undoubtedly, the trial judge was given an opportunity to correct his error and, and declined to do so. Um, there was also some discussion about... Um, the request for uh, compliance. As we've noted, a couple of the conditions don't even require requests for compliance. So those alone would be sufficient to go to the jury and reject that as a basis for, uh, for affirming. But um, as far as Ms. Catano is concerned, again, the evidence is very clear. She was authorized to act on behalf of, um, of five-star claims as clients in communicating with insurance company. 
and there, there's discussion of, well, the email said one thing, but the letter said something different, and the public adjuster only received the letter. Well, the letter was attached to the email. So the only way he could have received the letter was if he got the email as well. I, the evidence doesn't show this, but the logical inference is, of course, that Ms. Catano, the administrative assistant for Mr. Downs, the adjuster, simply forwarded it to Mr. Downs and said, you know, here's the here's the correspondence from Universal. Um, the uh, the protecting of the property. I know that there was some discussion. Council said that um, that Ms. Dr. Modi adequately protected the property. Frankly, that's the condition that we feel the evidence was strongest for Universal. The testimony was very clear that the storm hit in October 2016. Um, there's water pouring in through the floor, through the roof. He's putting down buckets. Uh, the buckets may be protecting the floor from getting damaged, but what about the roof that the water is eating away at as it comes through? He finally gets around to calling uh, a roofing company in January 2017, so we're about four months later. Testimony is that the roofing company comes out at some point in 2017, attempts a patch, but Dr. Modi is very clear that, hey, it didn't work. You know, and I'm a very busy vet veterinarian. I couldn't do anything about it. All I could do is put down buckets, hope for dry weather, and wait for Williams Roofing to show up and fix my roof. And when did that happen? Dr. Modi's testimony played to the jury was that that happened in January of 2018, or not January, excuse me, sometime in 2018. So at a minimum, 14 months or so after the storm hit. That's not taking measures to protect the damaged property. There's no question that significant damage, water damage can happen if every time it is raining, the water is coming through your roof, it's percolating through the roof into the home. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to take up any more time than is necessary, unless the court has any specific questions with respect to any of the arguments that were raised. I will uh, rest on the brief and ask that the court reverse and uh, remand for a new trial. All right, thank you both very much for your presentations this morning. I thought it was professionally done. Um, we'll take the matter under advisement and we'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much.